and welcome to 15 Minutes in Canberra. I'm Hayley Channer, Senior Policy Fellow with the Perth US Asia Centre. Today, my guest is Lisa Sharland. Lisa is the Adjunct Senior Fellow, Protecting Civilians in Conflict Program with the Stimson Centre. Lisa has spent the previous seven years in Canberra with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, where she was a Deputy Director, Defence Strategy and National Security, and also head of its international program. With ASPE, Lisa's research focused on UN peace operations reform, Australia-Africa engagement, and protection, protection of civilians. Lisa has provided strategic advice to the Australian government, as well as international organisations, and I'm delighted to say she joins me now. Lisa, welcome. Thanks so much, Hayley. Lisa, you've had an incredible career and one that I'm sure a lot of people who are interested in foreign affairs and working for the United Nations would kill for. How did you get to where you are now? What is the story? Look, that's a very good question to start on. And I think like a lot of people in this field, it's not a mapped out path that I've sort of followed through graduate programs or anything that might be a little bit more familiar to a a few of your listeners. So I started out, I guess we should start very briefly at at university doing a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws degree at Macquarie University. Not sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I had an interest in foreign policy and international affairs. And during the first few years of that degree, I managed to take part in a program called the Uni Capital Washington Internship Program and interned for then Senator Chuck Hagel uh, when he was serving in the Senate. And that was eye-opening for me. I mean, it really, I had a huge interest in US foreign policy, US domestic politics. You know, it was also the time when West Wing was big and watching all those sorts of things. So it was a really interesting. It's still big. Okay. Uh, West Wing is live forever. (laughs) um, Well, it feels like a bit of a utopia at times these days, but um, no. And that to me, I was like, I really want to get back to Washington and, and, and do some more work there. So anyway, I finished my law degree. I spent some time paralegaling in a commercial law firm and working in their knowledge management department and decided probably the best way to do that would I'm, to go back to, to university and, and do my master's degree. So I did a master of international studies at the University of Sydney and managed to, and I was doing that part-time whilst, while working full-time and managed to configure it in a way that I could spend the last semester uh, studying abroad in Washington at the George Washington University at their Elliott School of International Affairs. And this was the end of 2008. So we, we had a big presidential election happening. Of course, um, those that were around would remember that's when um, Obama was elected president. And at the same time, I managed to go back and, and intern uh, on Capitol Hill, this time for a, a Democratic congressman from Florida, Elsie Hastings, uh, who un- unfortunately has recently passed away. Um, and it was, it was interesting in terms of the exposure there. I realized this was a field that I wanted to be working in. And I continued on that path of doing another internship, which you'll see a theme here, I think, for a lot of people starting out in their careers. Uh, Funnily enough, interning at the Stimson Centre in their East Asia program at the time. And so shortly after that, I was finishing up my time in the US. I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. I had no job on the horizon. And I applied for an opportunity at the Australian Permanent Mission to the UN in what they call locally engaged staff positions as a policy advisor for defence. Happened to get that job. And then next thing I know, I'm moving to New York. And so for me, that was a a dream job, you know, to be working for the Australian government, um, taking part in meetings at the UN, working on policy, learning about how the Australian government works, not in Canberra, but overseas. So it was a really interesting time. Anyway, sort of fast forward, you know, we were running for the Security Council at the time. We then got on the Security Council and I decided I I probably needed to come back to Australia for a bit and happened to apply at ASPE and took up the position there. So we've kind of um, grew in that position over the last seven or so years, uh, working on issues of interest that I developed some expertise in, um, no matter how sort of limited that may have been at the time, on peacekeeping and working on women, peace and security and and various other issues and just sort of um, ended up where I am now. So I think that's a very long description of of what has been sort of a very zigzag career Mm -hmm. path today. Well, it sounds like a dream run, to be honest, but I'm sure you had a lot of um, trials and tribulations among that that time. I mean, just thinking about my own career and how I had to do many internships and I went back to study because I thought, what am I going to do now? I guess I'll go back to study. 
Well, I think there was a point there um, where one of my parents turned around to me and said, you've nearly been at university for eight years. What on earth are you going to do with your life? And um, so it wasn't until, you know, my mid to late 20s that I, I sort of, you know, headed off overseas more permanently. So I think if anything, these things can take a bit of time. It's not necessarily going to happen immediately. And you've just got to have a bit of patience, which I know everyone says, but it's really frustrating as you can probably um, sympathize with as well. Hmm. Now, Lisa, tell me a little bit more about your new position with Stimson. Your title is Adjunct Senior Fellow Protecting Civilians in Conflict Program. What does that actually involve? And I mean, just because of what's happening in Afghanistan now, my mind immediately goes to protecting civilians in Afghanistan. How will your role actually function in practice? Look, that's a really good question. So I'm, I'm four weeks into the, the position at the moment, working remotely from Canberra, and we'll be eventually relocating to Washington later in the year, um, if, if all goes well. Look, firstly, a bit of background on the Stimson Centre. So it's a think tank based in Washington, D.C. It's been around for, for 30 years. It was sort of founded in, in the, the latter years or at towards the end of the Cold War and really focuses, I think, a lot on identifying global problems, um, trying to generate new ideas and building solutions around a, a whole spectrum of, of different international security issues. And so, as I'd mentioned earlier, I'd spent some time there as a research intern. So I had some exposure to what Stimson did. Uh, and uh, about six years ago in my career, I was over there as a visiting fellow working on their protection of civilians program and have remained a non-resident fellow since then. So I'd had a little bit of an introduction to the work they, they do. Interestingly enough, I became even more familiar with some of their work when I was working in the Australian government as well, because they were doing a lot of work with the UN, looking at the mandates that had been authorised by the Security Council for peacekeeping missions, explicitly stating that they had to protect civilian populations. And the challenge at that point in time, about 10 years ago, and even to this day, was that despite the Security Council having authorised peacekeeping missions to protect civilians since 1999, uh, there was no guidance at the time on, on how they were meant to do that. So it wasn't traditionally a function of, of military or police personnel or even the civilian components of missions. That has evolved significantly now, but part of the focus, I think, on some of that work has, has now evolved into looking at uh, where are the gaps, where do we address the challenges that are happening, and also a focus beyond um, peacekeeping as well. And I should note here, Stimson has been engaged in work on peace operations for decades, um, and there's been some, you know, individuals who are well known in this field and certainly feel that you know their shoulders I'm standing on in terms of being able to come into a position like this and build on that work with an amazing team and so a lot of the work that that we'll be doing will continue to focus on some of those issues and also more broadly what we mean when we talk about protecting civilians in in conflict scenarios whether or not that be peace operations or other conflict settings now you mentioned there briefly um, Afghanistan Look, I think the point I'd make here is I think this is what we see unfolding at the moment with the evacuation, with the Taliban takeover, with the impact that's having on civilians in terms of internal displacement, but also refugees fleeing overseas, is that this is an issue certainly in terms of the broader discussion around protection of civilians and what that means, but I think also too in terms of what it means for, for international security and engagement of um, you know, countries like Australia, certainly the US, European partners, um, NATO partners, and so on. And so I think, you know, there is a, a much broader implication there, not just when we look through that lens of protecting civilians, which is so incredibly important. And we see the tragic circumstances that are unfolding now, whether it be in terms of those we've engaged with um, when it comes to human rights defenders or women activists and civil society, what we've done to reform the security sector in building up the police and the military and so on. Uh, there's going to be some long-term implications of what that looks like because the, the transition process, the drawdown of that has not been orderly. Uh, it has not been coordinated and there hasn't been long-term planning that's happened. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to see the fallout of that if, for not, if not for years, but for decades. And the impact of that on civilians is going to continue to be significant um, moving forward. So Lisa, just changing focus a little bit now to look at the Indo-Pacific region and to look at Africa, which is not often discussed as being part of the Indo-Pacific, um, but my own Perth US Asia Centre is perched on the rim of the Indian Ocean, looking out towards Africa. And I know that you've had um, some time traveling around Africa and also examining security issues within particular African nations. Can you reflect on your time um, engaging with Africa and also provide some insights into whether or not 
Africa as a continent and particular countries within it fit into the Indo-Pacific concept and security? So my short answer to the last part of that question would be yes, I think there is scope for Africa to be considered as part of the Indo-Pacific sort of concept um, that has been seized upon, um, particularly more recently. We know, for instance, at least from an Australian government perspective, that this hasn't been the case. So the 2017 foreign policy white paper, for instance, excludes Africa from the concept of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I quote, you know, it starts with ranging from the Eastern Indian Ocean, for instance. So it doesn't even include the East Coast of Africa, despite organisations like the Indian Ocean Rim Association, including countries, you know, that, that are on the Eastern Coast of Africa. So I'll leave that there. I don't necessarily agree um, with that approach, but I can also see from a, a resourcing standpoint and looking at the strategic dynamics that we see in our region, the rationale behind that definition. I think things also look different depending on what coast of Australia you're in. And I always find it really different coming to Perth, engaging in discussions around Australia Africa Week, how the conversations about where Australia sits in the world can often look very different. You know, if you consider the fact that Perth is effectively as close to Nairobi as the crow flows, flies, I should say, as Sydney is to Beijing, I think it gives you a different perspective on sort of how we perceive the region that we live in. And the East Coast, I think, sometimes looks at things a bit differently from the, the West Coast, but I'm sure your colleagues will have some views on that as well. Um, look, I think one of the things to keep in mind, and you know, certainly I've been fortunate in the work that I've done the last few years to, to have an opportunity to travel to different parts of the continent, look at some different developments. We, we undertook a, a project a few years ago with ASPE, looking at, for instance, the role of the mining sector in preventing countering and preventing and countering violent extremism, given that there were some interests from an Australian context in looking at what our interests were on the continent and what impact some of the security developments were having. Similarly, I've also had an opportunity to travel there as part of the Australia Africa dialogue and also in terms of the work I've, I've been doing with other partner organisations on peace operations. I think from an Australian government perspective, the one point I would probably make at this stage is we are going to continue to see demographic shifts on that continent, uh, economic shifts, opportunities in terms of people seeking education and, and working with other countries that I think are going to be important to Australia's strategic relationships going forward. And I think particularly this will be important in a multilateral context. When you keep in mind that there are 54 member states on the African continent, that are engaged um, across the spectrum of issues, that are engaged when it comes to candidacies and other things that we have interest in, we need to be cautious about perhaps losing sight of the importance of engaging with Africa on some of these issues. That's the more narrow view, but I think at the, at the broader global view, issues such as COVID, issues such as security, issues such as terrorism, economic investment, and so on, environment, climate, and everything, um, highlight the fact that we, we need to be thinking a little bit more from an Australian context, what our engagement with not just the African continent looks like, but with, you know, different African countries as well, because sometimes we, we overlook uh, in, in that sort of um, fashion of looking at Africa broadly as a continent, we overlook some of those bilateral relationships as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we also need to keep that in mind. What does that mean in the next 10 to 15 years? as we start to see some power um, shifts happen, not only on the continent there, but also within our region. Hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, Australia's focus based off of its um, foreign affairs resourcing, it does need to prioritise countries, but does that mean writing off an entire continent um, to our west? I think that's pretty short-sighted when there could be very particular countries that could be great um, partners for us to have. And also, Lisa, I've noticed a trend towards, uh, sorry, a trend away from multilateralism or at least a lack of popularity towards multilateralism in Australian foreign policy thinking. Can you reflect on your engagement working with different multilateral organisations and perhaps what the Australian government is um, doing in terms of its engagement with multilateral organisations? Do you think that it's putting less emphasis on these and what kind of impact do you think that's going to have? I think it's a really timely question. I think with the dynamics that we've seen around the, the shift in US administrations and also the discussions we've been having here domestically. So to go back briefly to the 2017 foreign policy white paper, it referenced very carefully that Australia's engagement in multilateral institutions such as the UN, for instance, was predicated on a very engaged US 
And I think what we saw throughout the Trump administration challenged what that meant for Australian engagement in multilateralism. If we didn't have that strong leadership from a country which um, historically has been quite like-minded in, in terms of our engagement in multilateral institutions, not always on the same page on everything, but quite like-minded. And so we, we saw play out in the last few years in Australia, the Prime Minister Morrison gave a speech in 2019 where he alluded um, or expressed concerns about this idea of negative globalism. And then we saw last year that the Foreign Minister Maurice Payne um, delivered a speech where she referred to the findings of the multilateral audit that had been undertaken by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And in effect, that multilateral audit found that there were good reasons for the Australian government to engage and invest in multilateral institutions. Um, but also to make sure that they're fit for purpose. And so I think we need to recognise that, you know, when we talk about multilateral institutions, there's a huge plethora of them, you know, both within the UN system, within regional organisations, you know, the G7, all sorts of other, all sorts of other formats and structures. They are imperfect institutions. The UN is particularly imperfect, you know, it's, it's 70 years old. But I think as a lot of people recognise, we could not create, I think, that same level of global co cooperation in the environment we live in today as we probably could 70 years ago. So it's really important, I think, that we think about how we can work within those institutions, how we can affect small change, which may be incremental at different points in time, how we can reflect issues and values that we, we feel strongly about. Lisa, I want to shift the focus back to you now. I want you to reflect on your career and say, for instance, you got to speak to a younger version of yourself. Is there any particular career advice that you would offer somebody just about to embark on a career looking into peacekeeping and the UN and uh, women, peace and security, for instance, that you'd like to share? Such a good question and one I reflect on a lot because you do get asked that when, you, when you're talking to a lot of folks who are starting out and... Look, there are a lot of things I'd tell myself. Look, the first one, and it sounds probably pretty innocuous, um, but working in the environment I do and having had such a focus on, on peacekeeping um, would have been to have learnt French. Mm. It would not have been seen as a priority, you know, sort of 20 years ago or so when I was starting out at university. But um, And I dabbled a bit in learning Russian and a few other, you know, attempting to, I should say attempting because I've never been able to pick up another language efficiently. Um, However, you know, that is something, there are a lot of peacekeeping missions deployed these days in Francophone countries. And that's, you know, um, something you learn in your career, you have to figure out a way to, to engage and, and sort of work around that. So that to me would have, if I had have known I would have ended up here, I would have said, you know what, enroll in French at the start and just see how you go. You may not get very far, but you know, anyway, so that's not for everyone. I admit but that's quite particular to me. Uh, look, I would be saying to people starting out, if you have an interest in the work of the UN, of, of peace operations, even development or working in conflict environments, early on in your career, do the best that you can to get out to those environments, to, to volunteer, to work for NGOs, to find out what's happening on the ground, um, learn another language. These are all things, you know, looking back that, that I, I think would have really en enhanced, I think, my understanding and opportunity of some of these things. And I think the other thing you don't realise sort of when you're in your late teens and early 20s that, you know, family life comes along and different other demands on your time and it becomes much more challenging to do that later. So I think, you know, that's a bit of career advice. Well, it's so lovely. It actually makes me feel good about the field that we work in. <laughs> <laughs> and there, are, you know what, at the end of the day, 95% of the time, most people are going to happily give up their time to talk to you about what they're doing or what they're working on. They remember what it's like when you're starting out, when you're an intern or you, you may not be earning a lot and you, you need to find out advice. You know, you never lose sight of that, I think. And so I think, you know, and if someone turns around and said, you know what, I, I just don't have time to talk to you about something, then to be quite honest, they're, they're probably not worth talking to. Mm, it's such a good point, isn't it? Because the people that are really passionate about our field want to help other people get into our field. Lisa, I wanted to end with asking you a question about something weird that might have happened to you in the course of your career. I mean, lots of people have a dinner party story like that. Do you have something like that? I don't necessarily have a dinner party story. And I'm probably not going to share some of the different stories that have come out of working on ministerial visits. <laughs> uh, um, that's probably for another time. But Look, one story I will share that's probably a little bit timely today um, because ASPE has just put out a publication reflecting on its 20th anniversary. And one of the stories that's reflected in there, I was in, engaged in a few years ago now um, when we hosted our Australia Africa Dialogue in Zambia at a place called the Royal Zambezi Lodge on um, the um, Zambezi River. 
amazing place. It's sort of in the middle of all this sort of wildlife. Um, and we'd taken a delegation from Australia, uh, quite a senior delegation of some government officials and folks in government. Um, and uh, our partners there, Brenthurst, has brought together a similar delegation from the African side um, across the continent with different levels of um, engagement on security issues and economic issues and so on. And so we had this two-day dialogue in this remote place um, in, this, in this lodge. And anyway, I can't remember if it was the first or second day, and we were sitting around in that format that would be so familiar to anyone who's been at a track 1.5, sitting around a round table with a dialogue, talking about different issues that would form the basis of our report and recommendations. Anyway, sure enough, throughout this discussion, I kid you not, an elephant appears in the doorway <laughs> of this room, standing outside, lifting up its trunk, um, and well, I, that, that means it's good luck, Lisa. Well, hopefully it was. <laughs> and there is actually, you know, not to, you know, I will shamelessly give a plug to my sort of um, former employer here in the publication. There is a photo of this event um, in the publication. Um, and to talk about a surreal moment to actually see an elephant in the room and yeah. the ongoing jokes that have come out of that discussion about elephants in the room and confronting them and what that means for think tanks has, has been endless. <laughs> but um, you know what? It, it's, you know, it was a sort of, life pinching moment in terms of being able to do something and the work that I've been able to do in the oh. career I've had to date. And I've been so fortunate to, to have that as part of my career. Um, and it's definitely a memory that um, will not disappear quickly. Wow, oh, you've made me really want to go and travel to Africa now and go on safari and see an elephant. <laughs> you should definitely do it. Lisa, thank you so much for spending the time to take us through your incredible career and all of the different experiences you've had and life lessons you've learned. We really appreciate it. No, thanks so much, Hayley. It was a pleasure to be part of the discussion.